Welcome to another water cooler conversation. I'm Nick Cater. I'm executive director of the Menzies Research Centre. I was born towards the end of the 1950s, which gave me the good fortune of living through the most prosperous and, and probably the most peaceful decades on earth. There have been conflicts, of course, uh, and there are many, many of them bloody, but compared to my parents' generation who lived through World War II or my grandparents who knew the horror of World War I, my generation and, and those that came after us have been uniquely fortunate. There is, however, a distinct change in the air. This peaceful, Western-dominated world order, secured by the victors in World War II at incalculable cost, is showing signs of fraying. Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and communist China's global ambitions may have already propelled us into a new era of global strategic tension, when what is at stake is nothing less than the cultural and strategic dominance of Eurasia and the Pacific, and possibly the whole globe. Which brings us to a deeply challenging question. Are today's Australians, Brits, Canadians, Americans ready for what lies ahead? Will they find the courage, if it's needed, to stand up in defence of their country and indeed freedom and Western civilization, Or has the decline in values and possibly in character turned the West into a force that lacks the will to defend itself? And in any case, what can be done? Well, with me to discuss this uh, momentous question, I guess it's very hard to think of anything else that's more pressing or more consequential at the moment. With me to discuss this is former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson and now the presenter and host of the very successful uh, conversation series on YouTube and podcast. John, welcome very much to uh, the water cooler again. Terrific to be with you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. So perhaps first we should actually set out the case for uh, the argument that we're moving into this new era, era of strategic uncertainty with which will come uh, inevitable tensions and probably conflicts between uh, superpowers or countries with, with different ideas of who should be dominating the world, to put it crudely. Uh, what is the evidence for this from your point of view, or have I wildly overstated the case in my introduction? I wish I could say that I felt you had overstated it, but I don't think you have. I think we're living in a very dangerous age. I think the Prime Minister's actually framed it as well or better than anybody else in the world today. We face a new arc of autocracy. Uh, it's probably important to state at the outset that what we've experienced since the end of the Second World War, an era of relative peace, when the most powerful nations on earth, uh, particularly since the coming down of the Berlin Wall, have essentially been committed to a peaceful global order, a rules-based set of uh, arrangements that allow a mid-sized power like Australia to, to thrive in freedom and so forth. That's not the norm in human history. We forget this. The norm is great tension. The, the norm is conflict. The norm is disagreement. The norm is adventurism and opportunism of the ugliest sort. That's the, the bloody history down through the ages. And the 20th century was particularly bad. At least the first half of it was. And we forget that. But what we now see is perhaps best characterised in a way by saying what we're seeing is a horrendous contrast between the loss of conviction in the West and the massive new conviction in the part of wealthy uh, and would-be authoritarian regimes. And conviction, unfortunately, wins out over self-doubt more often than not. So we really have got to decide, do we have the willpower to stand up for freedom? And it's even more urgent uh, that we ask that question at a time when we've been encouraged to not just self-doubt, perhaps even self-loathe ourselves, to say that our culture is bad, uh, we're the inheritors of something, uh, as uh, Frank Ferruti puts it, so nightmarish that it's not worth defending. Hmm. Well, look, uh, I mean, let's let's say at the outset that, that that global conflict is not inevitable, and and although of course we've already seen it um, ha occur in Ukraine, but I mean a wider global conflict is not inevitable, uh, and we hope it. It doesn't happen, but I, I, th I thought about it this way when I was running through it in my head, John. 
if we are prepared to take uh, such um, extraordinarily extensive action, an expensive action, to deal with the risk of climate change, uh, we should surely be dealing with this risk with as much figure, if not more. Would that be right? Well, I think that is right. Uh, it's necessary to secure the peace to, if you're going to go on and, and secure good environmental outcomes. I think that's very important. After all, it's the, the liberal, freedom-loving, well, in theory at least, freedom-loving uh, Western democracies that have been at the forefront of saying we've got a climate change problem and we need to act. I hadn't noticed too much concern in the autocratic countries about this problem. And that, that's something really that, um, that perhaps green voters should think through. Break the liberal global order, the rules-based order, that we've had where people are able to advance their cases, where they're not simply squashed by the people at the top. Arguments can rise to the fore uh, and you're not likely to see a good outcome if you're worried about climate change. You're right, of course, conflict is not inevitable. Um, but the more we self-doubt, the more we hollow ourselves out, the more we face people who are convicted of the rightness of their cause and as the president of China keeps putting it, the more successful way to run a society being the authoritarian one rather than the democratic one with all of its messiness. Um, so you've got the possibility of just continual, gentle, relative and absolute decline. And economics comes into this. And so does the whole issue of, of how we handle climate. Poorly designed climate policies will simply turbocharge the problem we've had since the great F the GFC, where the wealthy become fewer, but ever, ever wealthier, while everyone else finds it hard to you know, get into a home and get a start on life. Um, but you've got that scenario sort of uh, at one end of the spectrum, right through to the other, where, look, it has to be said that we don't know how Europe's going to finish up. Uh, uh, Russia has been rattling the nuclear sabre. And of course, that's pulled everybody into line. Everyone's saying, no, no, we can't risk an escalation. And I understand that sentiment. But I wonder whether history might not say and reveal that, that uh, you know, surely even in the Kremlin, they tremble at the idea of using nuclear power and nuclear weapons, whether the better response might not have been an immediate one from the West that just said, Buster, you try that and just see what happens. Particularly with hindsight, we can see that the Russians are really not as competent as we might have thought. Um, but they've cowed us. They've, they've got the West on the back foot again. Uh, and so, you know, pity the Ukrainians because it looks like something that will just drag on forever. Putin can't stop because in his mind, his prestige, probably even his life, depends upon not capitulating. The Ukrainians have shown us what real spirit is and what it's like to believe in freedom because you've known the alternative. You'll go to any lengths. This could grind on forever. There's no guarantee at all that Russia won't then move on other countries. As Henry Argus, as Argus has put it today, uh, or just recently, uh, uh, you know, it may be that our reluctance to engage is the very thing that will destroy the peace. Uh, as, as a Chinese saying has it, if you want war, if you want peace, prepare for war. Uh, and then on the other hand, we don't know how China's reading this. We don't know what they will do. They plainly are in the midst of a, a very real consideration of how they can displace the West. So they're quite intentional about it. Are we intentional about preserving our freedoms and insisting that it's Western democratic freedoms that have lifted people out of poverty, given them opportunities, and the best way forward in terms of continuing those things that mankind's ever evolved. Do we believe in ourselves? We've made mistakes, but let's say, you know, Churchill had it right, surely. For all of its faults, consider the alternatives. John, let me give you advance warning that I, I do want you to help me wrench the lever towards optimism at some point in this discussion, but let's stay on this uh, pessimistic, worst case scenario note. And and you mentioned that, that China has been the Chinese Communist Party has been quite explicit in its ambitions and its aims, which are to dominate the West. Uh, Putin has been too. I, I guess um, some of the some of the people in in um, in foreign affairs in the US have took the view that you know it was only rhetoric. But of course, 
they were sensationally proved to be wrong one month ago today, I think, when, you know, the, the troops and the tanks moved into Ukraine. And you'd have to say that on that, we cannot afford to assume that China is just joshing with us as well, you know, that there is every likelihood that they will proceed with what they're intend to do unless we do something to deter them. So what do we do to deter them? I mean, can you deter them? Can we come to a compromise? Okay. Or is that impossible? Is in the end the, the only response, absolute determined uh, willpower and with the force of arms, if necessary, to stop them in their tracks? Look, that's always to be avoided if possible. Uh, that it's the old, uh, it, it, nothing's changed. It, it, you know, you've got to look like and behave like, and if it, you know, if it quacks like a duck and it swims like a duck, it is a duck. Uh, confidence in yourself and in your own beliefs and values, and that's that's the greatest threat to freedom of all. So I think the key to it is to end the division, end the identity politics, get real about economic and environmental policies. Uh, there's no way we, you know, we don't have to avoid having our cake and eat it too, but we do have to be prepared to engage in some delayed gratification, if I can put it that way, making wise choices today for a better tomorrow. That's something we're not very good at anymore. Uh, we have to be realistic about um, things like um, expenditure uh, and uh, hardware and uh, the people to man that stuff. Um, it's incredible to see the change in Germany. Remember, you've got a left of centre government uh, and leader uh, and uh, a foreign minister drawn from the Greens who's saying our military is not fit for purpose. We're going to double defence expenditure. That would make Germany the third largest spender on defence in the world after America and China because Germany is a very wealthy country. So with conviction, if NATO follows through, reforms itself, stands up, uh, and if America keeps its eye on the Pacific region, if Australia and like-minded countries work together, then of course, uh, I'm very confident we can believe, we can, we can see this through and ensure that the world doesn't descend into an authoritarian um, uh, hellhole. Uh, I am quite confident of that provided only that we will learn the lessons. And how magnificent to see the, 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 the spirit and the, the courage and the conviction uh, and, and the, uh, the practical uh, uh, ingenuity, if I can put it that way, uh, of the Ukrainian people. It ought to inspire shame and inspire every one of us to something better. Well, here's the thing, isn't it? I mean you'd remember that that uh, that stunning movie by Peter Weir, Gallipoli. You can't get it out of your head, that final scene where the whistle blows and these young men go over the top of the trenches straight at the towards the bayonets and the guns of the Turks. Uh, and I you know I watch and think about though that scene many times and think, well, would my generation be able to match the courage of that generation? You know, my pampered generation, if you like, you know, we've we've had it so good in so many ways and we've become so comfortable and so used to a peaceful world. Would we have the guts to do it? And and that's 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 a very big question, John. But you 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 think deeply about matters of courage and honour. What are your thoughts? Yeah, like you, I was a baby boomer, mid baby boomer, and I missed war, which is incredible and I'm very thankful for it. Uh, but I lived in the shadow of it because my father uh, had gone off. Uh, he was a man who hated violence, although he was uh, a bit like a former prime minister, a champion uh, boxer. Uh, he hated violence, my father. But off he went, 9th Division. Uh, they were left in the Middle East. Montgomery's great pushback against Rommel, and my father was almost killed. His mates were told, he, Dad would never talk about this, but his mates were told that he wouldn't see the night out. He did. He made it back to Australia. He slowly recovered and was able to pick his life up eventually. Uh, but, and having that consciousness has made me often ask, would I have the courage? I hope I would. And it's a very real issue. And I think it's, it's not until you face that situation that 
you perhaps will make a final decision on whether you would stand up. But Compass Polling has done some very interesting work on how Australians feel if they were put into a Ukrainian type situation, would they um, fight or would they flee? And interestingly enough, more would flee at this stage than fight, despite mm. the fact that most of them agreed with the proposition that we ought to do more to train our young people for the possibility of conflict, which is really interesting. Also interesting that coalition supporters are very strongly supportive of a modern cadet corps. Uh, green voters are not, which does highlight some very interesting realities about the world we now live in. Yeah, this is, this is an idea you put forward, we've discussed a few times, the idea that we could boost up, revive the cadet for corps, um, you know, training young people, I think up to the age of 18, in, uh, in, in, in a, a lot of really basic, useful life skills, apart from anything, but, you know, in, in preparation for defending their country if necessary, but also in dealing with natural disasters and floods. Um, it, it seems to me to be a, a great idea. And I think from the polling that we've done, it, it seems to me that the, most people support that idea. Is that right? It's very interesting. Two thirds of Australians believe that uh, a cadet corps would be a good thing. Keep in mind that um, uh, the, the great majority of Australians, I've actually got the numbers here, um, uh, on balance, Australians would like defence expenditure to be increased by 75%. And as part wow. of that, uh, Compass Polling, very good polling company, went out and had a good look uh, at um, how people felt about equipping our young people better. And my idea of this, for what it's worth, would be to say, uh, cadet corps um, have, have withered on the vine a bit. There's around 220 of them in Australian schools, not many in the public sector, mostly in the private sector. Uh, some of them still quite big. Uh, and of course, in terms of leadership training, armaments training, how to use uh, military equipment uh, in resilience and, um, if you like, the development of, of stamina and stickability, uh, a, you know, a lot of Australians think this would be a very good idea. I think you would actually add several strands and even give young people an option if you were to revamp them so that you could have traditional military training. I had four years of it. I didn't enjoy the first three years. I loved the, the last year of it, the fourth year of it. Uh, but you'd also, in this day and age, you train people up in cyber warfare, critical to our, important, our future, uh, to, um, I would have thought, resilience in terms of uh, coping with man-made uh, and natural disasters. You might focus on geopolitical skills because I don't think our young people come out of our schools with an understanding of the comparative governmental and cultural arrangements around the world. And that brings me back to the Greens. Very interesting. Coalition supporters are very keen on the idea they would stay, they would fight uh, to a much greater degree, say, than Greens. And we need the focus on the Greens at the moment. Their federal leader has said this. New Zealand is the gold standard for defence. So whilst most Australians think we should increase defence by 75%, they get that the world is dangerous. The Greens say we should halve it, halve it, take it down to 1%, and gold standard is the New Zealand approach. Well, it's little more than a policing force, really, to be honest. I don't like to be rude to the New Zealanders, but that's the reality of it. You know, it's, a, mm. it's, 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 not, it's not even a one-shot military anymore. I'm sorry to say that, but it's the reality. That's the path they've chosen to go down. And I think that reflects, well, it's, sorry, I, I've talked long enough, but it does reflect a lack of reality on the part of Greens, which is Green voters, which is interesting because most of them would think they were well-educated and understood the world well. Yeah, so at the moment, I, I believe we've got something around 56,000 personnel in the Australian Armed Forces. This is an interesting number to cast back to, though. In 1942, the heart of World War II, we had 476,000 Australians under arms. That was in a country of 7.2 million people or thereabouts, which means that if, 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 we, if we had to increase our armed forces per capita to the level they were at in 1942, we'd be talking about 1.5 or more million people under arms. Now, clearly, modern warfare does not demand, uh, you know, labour, if you like, or personnel in that quantity. A lot more of it is clever, but we do, we have seen in 
Ukraine and elsewhere, that you do still need substantial people on the ground and, of course, everybody that backs it up. So if we're serious about this, we've got to prepare for a considerable expansion in our armed forces, aren't we, if, if required, and, and, and certainly an expansion in spending. Uh, you know, as you point out, most people expect that, believe it should happen, but we're, what, 2.3%, 2.4% of GDP at the moment, which is very good considering we'd fallen back to the lowest percentage since World War One under under the Labour government, we've gone we've gone back up, but we probably need to be three, even four percent, don't we, to get up close to where, say, Israel is. You know, a, a small country that makes itself very prickly and very unattractive to you know would be attackers simply by having a very efficient and well funded defence force. Well, I think that's right. I mean, if you look at the Ukrainians, they didn't have, by Russian standards, and magnificent and huge military at all, but it was obviously highly trained and they put a lot of thought into it. They've been well supplied by the Americans until Biden became president and they've been able to put up an incredible show. I've no doubt that Australians could do the same. No, we're not talking about being attacked at the moment, but here's the point. We've got to be ready for a very unstable world. Our forebears were, were you know, we're coming up to Anzac Day. Uh, in, in 1905, on a bipartisan basis, a little country of five and a half million people decided we needed a, a first-class navy. Uh, and they went to the Brits and said, you know, we want you to build us a navy. The Brits initially said, uh, oh, you can't do that. You might go adventuring. But they were persuaded and it was ordered. And five years later, it arrived just in time to secure our homeland for the First World War. I've been remembering that the Pacific was full of the you know, German, had massive German concentrations of German power, uh, including in Papua New Guinea. Now, people forget that because we celebrate, rightly, what happened with our troops, horrendous loss of life and so forth. And you've just mentioned it uh, on the, uh, in the Western Front, but also in Gallipoli and what have you. What we forget is that we'd read the tea leaves. We could see the world was becoming very unstable. We'd taken action which enabled us to secure our homeland so that those troops could go offshore. And it, the same was not true in the 1930s. The country was asleep at the wheel. We were very much alert during the Cold War. Australia had probably the most powerful um, air force uh, in, in Asia. Um, you know, the army was certainly respectable. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the Navy was very powerful, really, by the standards of the size of the country. Uh, and the Cold War didn't happen, and I would argue in large part simply because we had our act together, we plainly believed in ourselves, uh, and in the end you had the collapse of the Berlin Wall and we thought democracy had won out. Well, we now know that we can assume no such thing, so we ought to be ready. We have a very, very small number of people actually in uniform, minuscule even by the standards of the region. We have some very good hardware, some very skilled people, but nowhere near enough, and I would argue still lacking in some of the right materials, this needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency. I'm one of that 10%, I, according to the polling, that says who believe that the issue in the upcoming election is who can best handle our security going forward. I'd put it the other way. Who can best secure a peaceful future for Australia? That is the debate that matters at the moment, and it goes right to the heart of the reason we have a federal government if I can reflect my own biases. You know, having grown up in the shadow of war, it gave me such a deep abhorrence. Uh, you know, my father, right up until the day he died, would occasionally wait, reliving the moment when the Germans found the guns. And you realise what a terrifying moment it must have been. And a few minutes later, he was unconscious and he thought he was going to die. It gave me that deep abhorrence of war and it absolute conviction that the way to avoid it or to maximise the chances of avoiding it is to make sure you're ready for things to go wrong. Um, well, I hear, let, let, me, let, me, let me tug at that optimism lever and just see, see how hard you resist it. We, you know, it, it, it is, of course, tempting to make comparisons with the 1930s, the, which is it's not unreasonable because that was the last time World War II was the last time that the world order was being challenged to any degree by, um, you know, sizable forces, notably Germany and Japan. Uh, but in the 1930s, uh, we, I, I would say we were not as well prepared 
as we are now in this degree. Now at least we have international institutions to bind the free world together. None of them are perfect. I mean, the NATO alliance is far from perfect. The EU, goodness help us, is a long way short of perfect. But we have here in Australia the AUKUS agreement, which I, I, I maintain is is the greatest achievement of this coalition, recent coalition government under Scott Morrison, which is you know, three-way agreement, of course, with the US and UK, which involves the exchange of nuclear technology. Uh, that's vital. And the fact that that can still happen and still we can still give birth to something as important as that, even with a a, a president like, you know, as 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 seemingly um, weak as 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 Joe Biden in office shows the strength of America and the strength of the alliance. But we have those in place now. In 1939, there was nothing similar. The, the League of Nations was just turned into a farce and uh, there was nothing to bind nations together. But now we do. Surely with that architecture in place, we're in a much better position to stand up uh, as the free world and say, look, you won't go any further to tyrants. Uh, the points you make are very good ones. And, and, and in many ways, what I'm trying to do is to mount a defence of that rules-based set of arrangements where it doesn't matter the size of a country is not, not, is not relevant to whether or not that country is respected and its sovereignty is, uh, is put on a pedestal. Those things are very important. That's what we enjoy now. What I'm saying is that we've got to stoke the fires of belief in what we have and in one sense, 9-11 was uh, a, a, a encouraging because nations pulled together in the face of the threat of terrorism at that time. And in another sense, whilst we've seen this terrible driftage, which is what I'm trying to warn against, all those NATO countries letting their defence budgets slip away to nothing, um, the lack of preparedness and so forth, the uh, uh, serious winding back of defence under President Obama, drawing red lines in the sand, cross this and we'll do something terrible and then nothing happened. The South China Seas went ahead because the Chinese thought, well, America's not going to stand up and do anything and they didn't. Um, the very point I'm trying to make is we've had a massive wake up call. The early signs are incredibly encouraging in Europe. Take Germany, uh, take the Scandinavian countries. Denmark's already a member of NATO. You've got other countries now must be really uh, focusing the minds of the Russians and the Chinese, the West hasn't lost its sting completely. And my plea is we need to hold the course. As Neil Ferguson uh, said in a conversation I had with him the other day, one of the great dangers is that we go back to sleep. We cannot go back to sleep. And then we come to Australia. Let's not lose this, uh, the, this compass polling that you and I were talking about for a moment ago. Here's the irony. A clear majority, very, two thirds or so of Australians say we ought to do more to train our young people in these areas, uh, uh, cadet corps and what have you, yet over half say they would flee the country if we were facing a Ukrainian situation. I have to say to you, that, that's on the surface of it, it's very worrying. Do we believe in ourselves? But if push came to shove, there'd be a lot of young people at the moment who might be thinking, gee, I'd just flee, I wouldn't be part of that. But they'd stop if these circumstances came and said, I, I would think and say, gee, what about my responsibilities to my aged parents? What about my sister? What about my wife, my girlfriend, my child? What about my community? And that mind focusing effect would be wonderful. The thing is to not let it get to the stage where we're in that sort of situation. That's my plea. Uh, and like you, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply abhorrent of the idea of conflict. Uh, I'm a person who hates violence, but I, I, I think the way to stop it sometimes is to make certain that the biggest person in the room is a friend. Uh, and globally, frankly, that translates into very simply, we want America to stay strong and to be the leader of freedom and to make sure those very institutions that you're talking about don't fail. Yeah, because in the end, it's a matter of, it, it's up here, isn't it? It's willpower. I mean, Francis Fukuyama said some fine words this week, with, with which I largely agree. He said, Putin has created a certain amount of moral clarity. The biggest advantage of a liberal state is that it's not authoritarian. Putin's demonstrated what the alternative to liberalism is. And I think that's right, and that's the encouraging thing. But 
in the end, as Menzies pointed out in, in his Freedom from Fear speech in July 42, it takes more than sentiment. You know, nice words are one thing, but in the end, it takes courage and action and determination to stand up to uh, tyrants. And uh, there are no half measures. There are no half measures. In the end, you either resist them entirely or you you roll over and you don't resist them at all. So hey, where can let let us where are we going to find that 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 inner strength from uh, as a as a people, as individuals indeed, as nations, John? Well, it, it always boils down, I think, to strong and clear leadership. Um, uh, as I say, I think this is what the upcoming election should be about. Uh, I don't think Scott Morrison gets the credit he should for having framed the dangers that the free world faces on the international stage. He's done it very well. He's focused people's minds on what really matters before the Ukraine in a way that's pretty remarkable for a mid-sized power uh, and its leader, in my view. Um, now, uh, having, done, having said that, uh, we now need to realise, I think, as a people, that all of the policy issues that we're worried about will fade into uh, the mists and wokeism is about, uh, you know, it splatters like an insect on the screen of a speeding motor car when it runs into the uh, turret of an authoritarian regime's tank. Um, and so it's about the public debate. It's the very things that we're talking about now. We've, we've got to prosecute the case. And here's where leadership comes in. As the same Compass Polling Company that we've been talking about was able to demonstrate that in March last year, 12, 12 months ago, only around a third of Australians thought we should have nuclear submarines. By the time AUKUS was announced, or when AUKUS was announced, polling showed that it had doubled to two thirds. What happened? Was it just that people became convinced the world was more dangerous? No, there was strong leadership from the prime minister and the government. My point, strong leadership really matters. But look, the other thing that I think we've got to do, we face external pressures. I think Alan Tards and Frank Ferrudi has often visits this country from his um, academic base in Kent in the, in the UK and is a keen observer of Australia. We have been inculcating in our young people the idea that our culture's rotten, that there's something nightmarish about it. Frank Ferrudi talks about destaturing, moving Australia Day and so forth and says they look like attacks on history. They're actually attacks on our culture to convince our young people. Uh, that uh, we're not worth defending. Our culture's not worth defending. And Alan Tudge picked that up, I thought, very well. Well, we need to ask ourselves as parents and grandparents, uh, you know, uh, as we look at the education system, as we look at the curriculum, as we look at the way in which modern elites decry our culture, uh, learn the lessons of the Ukraine. Stop and think. This isn't good enough. No one says our background is perfect. But who wants to live in the alternative? As Frank, Francis Fukuyama uh, said, uh, you know, great moment of moral clarity. Do we have the capacity to understand that clarity? Well, John, thank you very much for your contribution. And I, I highly recommend some of your recent conversations on this subject, notably with uh, Victor Danson, Davis Hanson, and with uh, Neil Ferguson. And I'm sure you'll go on exploring these matters. So that's John Anderson's website. It's a it is a treasure trove of wise wise people uh, talking about contemporary things that really matter. So thank, John, thank you for joining us, John, and perhaps we shall come back to this conversation shortly. Good to talk to you as always, Nick.